Good evening, good evening, good evening. I am Trudy of the 21st Century Watchmen, and we are be covering today a series called It's About Time, where I will be covering the book of Lamentations, chapters 1, 2, 3, and verses 1 through 36 in chapter 3. So just to give you a little background of what a lamentation is, a lamentation is actually a passionate expression of sorrow or grief and weeping. So this is what this book is setting because you know as we've come out of where Jeremiah has been warning uh, Judah about their behaviors and, and that there was actual punishment coming. So now we've gotten into that particular portion of what's going on. This particular poetry is called a dirge poetry, which in itself, it, it's a kind of uh, poetry that actually also laments about the sorrows and those that actually have to uh, deal with funerals and the performance of the rites of these funerals. So we'll see this and as well that the actual poetry was written in an acrostic type of format, which is a, a Hebrew, they're using the Hebrew alphabet. So they're going through each and every one as they separate sentences and stanzas in the song. So you might as well say they made sure that they covered every form of grief from A to Z in using this particular format. So let's get started. Lamentations chapter one, verses one through two. How solitary and lonely sits the city, Jerusalem. Now we're talking about because of the captivity and the things that have happened. So this is the after effect we're talking about right now. It says that was once full of people. How like a widow she has become. So what used to be is now been taken away from them. She who was great among the nations, the prince among the provinces, has become a forced laborer. So now they've gone from their points of uh, royalty, uh, authority, and now they find themselves subjugated as common laborers now. So there is nothing that used to be that is like the same anymore. She weeps bitterly in the night, and her tears are constantly on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, political allies, so it's saying that she's just in such grief about what's going on, and everybody that they thought that were their friends or their allies that would be with them to help them to fight, they were left alone. She has no one to comfort her. All her friends had dealt treacherous, treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. So they left her standing all by herself. Judah has gone into exile under affliction and under harsh servitude. She dwells among the pagan nations, but she has found no rest. All her pursuers have overtaken her in the midst of her distress. So what they found that because they went along to get along or they assimilated to the environment that they were in, they were looking for these gods that they had put their trust into. And they were saying that they're dwelling among these things, but these gods that were supposed to give them um, what they needed, they have no rest. So now they're actually acknowledging the uselessness of this pagan uh, idolatry that they had adopted. The roads of Zion are in mourning because no one comes to the appointed feast. All her gates are desolate. Her prints are groaning. Her virgins are grieving and suffering and she sh suffers bitterly. So it just goes on about the angst and the anguish when they go back and they're recalling the things that used to bring them joy. Uh, it was always very festive when they got together for all the feasts, the annual feasts that were called. You know, people always at the gates of the city, of the hustle and the bustle of movement. And now it's all gone. It's all gone. So her adversaries have become her masters. So we're talking about them being taken over. Her enemies prosper for the Lord has caused her grief because of the multitude of her transgressions. Now, if you remember, God told them over and over again to get it together, to get it right. I'm giving you chance after chance. But yet they had not turned from their ways and they continued. To, so God's wrath was starting to manifest. It was showing up at this point. 
And it says, her young children have gone into captivity before the enemy. Beauty and majesty have departed from the daughters of Zion. Her prince have become like deer. So here they're talking about that the thing that makes any city or any entity, a family or church or whatever it may be, is the youth. Now it's saying her young are gone and they're into captivity. So meaning that those bloodlines can't be continued. There's no joy and no happiness. Children bring joy and happiness. So you're, they're talking about continual grief here. The beauty of the city, everything that they have built that they know it is no more. And then the ones that have authority, the prince, are they're running away like, like the deer in the forest. Like if you ever watch a deer, if there's a, a noise, you see they jet. This is exactly what they're saying that's happened to the prince here. They have no pastures. They have fled without strength before the pursuer. So they turned coat and ran. In the days of her affliction and homelessness. Now remember, they're taken away from what they've known all their lives into a land that, that, that is unknown to them at this point. So Jerusalem remembers all her precious things that she had from the days of old when her people fell into the hands of the adversary and no one helped her. The enemy saw her, they mocked at her downfall. So it was like they were sitting there, they were never truly with her. When they talk about her, we're talking about Jerusalem because it's personified the way that they're writing in this particular poetry when they talk about her. And um, they were just waiting for their downfall. They got along with them because it was probably the best thing to do versus being isolated. But once that uh, they befell this tragedy, then those that were supposed to help them just sit there and, and watched and laughed at them. Jerusalem sinned greatly. Therefore, she has become an unclean thing and has been removed. All who honored her now despise her. Before they had seen her nakedness, because, excuse me, because they had seen her nakedness, even she herself groans and turns her face away. So when it talks about seeing her nakedness, it talks about seeing her vulnerability, the things that weakened her, those things that were not up to par. That's what they got to see. Her ceremonial uncleanness was on her skirts. She did not seriously consider her future. Now in this first part of nine, what they're talking about, ceremonial uh, uncleanness, it goes back to talk about menstruous women. Because if you remember back in those days, they were not allowed to be around people, not to be touched or anything like that because they were considered unclean. So now they're talking about your skirt has been pulled up. You are ceremoniously uh, unclean. So they're talking about uh, a menses for a woman. That's the comparison that's here. She did not seriously consider her future. Therefore, she has come down from the throne to slavery. So they're talking about the dissension of what they have broken them down for. In an astonishing manner, she has no comfort. O oh Lord, cries Jerusalem, look at my affliction, for the enemy has magnified himself in triumph. Now, the, uh, God was constantly trying to tell them to turn, to turn, to turn, because they did not want his wrath to be upon them, but yet they didn't listen. And then it was, look how fast you went from where you were to where you are now. The, the, the sliding scale here was moving really fast. The adversary said, spread out his hand over all her precious and desirable things, for she has seen the Gentile nations into her sanctuary, the Jerusalem temple, the ones whom you command that they should not enter into your congregations, not even in your outer courts. So all of the ceremony that was uh, going forth and who could go where, where we know that only um, the the uh, priests could go into the to the uh, most holies of holies and, and there were inner courts and outer courts and all these things. But now we see our adversaries that are running through everything that was sacred to us. And they're laughing and, and, and doing whatever they want to as they ravish the temple. And these are not the voices that are supposed to be heard in this temple. So this is what they're talking about. All their people groan seeking bread. They have exchanged their desirable and precious things for food to restore their lives. See, O Lord, and consider how despised and repulsive I 
have become. So now what they thought before, those that were affluent enough to have things to exchange like that, they're like, look what you've brought me down to. I'm exchanging my, my treasures just for bread. I'm a beggar at this point. Is it nothing to you, all you who have passed this way? Look and see if there is any pain like my pain, which was severely dealt out to me. So now they're talking about, look, this is just wrong. You shouldn't have did me like this. But God had been warning them. And we know that Jeremiah had constantly been giving prophecy after prophecy after prophecy. Now we're getting to see the fulfillment of these things, which the Lord has inflicted on me on the day of his fierce anger. God had showed mercy, had showed love, but they took it for granted and they continued to do what they wanted to do or they called themselves appeasing him and then would turn back and do their same uh, wickedness and, and worship to idols. From on high, he set fire into my bones. Now this is interesting because here it was like he set fire into your bones. There's, there's this, this wrath that's going on, this rage. But Jeremiah used that same uh, phrase that it was like fire in my bones. He was talking about the, the spirit that he, he had, the spirit that was shut up in him, that it was like fire in his bones. So now they're feeling it on the complete opposite of that. It was like you're, they're feeling the natural aspect of it where Jeremiah felt the spiritual aspect of it. And it prevailed over them. He has spread a net for my feet. He has turned me back. He has made me desolate and hopeless, miserable, faint all the day long. So now he's talking about how he's bound him up, that, that he has turned his back on him. There's no recovery for them. They can't see a way out. So now they found that they're uh, hopeless and they're miserable. And it, it just doesn't happen in one instance that it's all the day long. So this is their constant uh their constant thing that they deal with all day long. The yoke of my transgression is bound by his hand and they are knit and woven together. They have come upon my neck. He has made my strength fail. The Lord has put me into the hand of those against whom I cannot stand. So he's saying the burden of what is going on, the weighty, the weightiness of being taken from a land that you know into a land that you don't know move from a, a place of authority to servitude. All these things, that's when it says his hands, they have uh, knit and woven together, meaning that they're interlocked. They can't do anything. They're in shackles. They, they, they're they bound. There's nothing that they can do. But they're, they're talking about this and that th they said that the Lord had put this upon them uh, with people that they could not stand. That, uh, they could not stand before them. They'd had no power at this point. So it's talking about taking you from power to powerless. The Lord has rejected all the strong men in my midst. He has proclaimed and established time against me to crush my young men. So here it's they're talking about the, uh, the young are actually uh, murdered because as they tried to fight back, they lost their lives. The Lord has trampled down as in a wine press, the virgin daughter of Judah. Now, the interesting thing when it says trample down uh, as in a wine press, that the men would go when they get all the grapes and they would get in a wine press and they would just basically press out all of the, the juices from all of the grapes that were there. But then all of the, uh, the trash, what they would consider, or the uh, things that were not useless, they took them and they threw them on a dunghill. So here's where he's making that uh, comparison. The Lord has trampled down as in a wine press, the virgin daughter of Judah. So he's just smashed them down. He's just annihilated them. This is what that description is. I weep for these things. My eyes overflow with tears because a comforter, one who could restore my soul is far from me. So they're realizing that these tears, that they have endless tears, they never stop. Because they realized that God above, who could have given them peace and rest, had removed himself from them. And he had blocked himself from hearing or having any type of empathy for them because they continued to disobey him. And this was part of what he had told them was what was to come if they did not turn from their ways. 
one thing about God is that he is not a man and he cannot lie. So if he said it, you better believe it. My children are desolate and perishing, for the enemy has prevailed. Zion stretched out her hands, but there is no comfort for her. The Lord has commanded concerning Jacob that his neighbor should be his enemies. Jerusalem has become a filthy thing, an object of content among them. So once which was uh, deemed as this pristine super city, now is, is looked at as, as basically a impoverished ghetto that they don't have anything that anybody would even want to be there because it says it's the object of contempt. They don't even want it around at this point. The Lord is righteous and just, for I have rebelled against his commandments, his word. Hear now all you people and look at my pain. My virgins and my young men have gone into captivity. Now here in the last portion where it talks about my virgin and my, my virgins and my young men have gone into captivity, is pivotal because they're saying at this point we don't even have the ability to rebuild with our children we can't even procreate so at that point if the children are in captivity they are subject to never get together because they didn't do this this mixing of races and and tribes and things like that that tribe would mate with that tribe and so the way that it's actually happened now they're in captivity, that the offspring could be from various different uh, tribes, Babylonians or, you know, anywhere else. But just the sanctity of their particular bloodline would be interrupted. So this is where 18 is very, very pivotal to what was going on with them. I, Jerusalem, call to my lovers, political allies, but they deceived me. My priests and my elders perished in the city while they look for food to restore their uh, strength. Now that is a shame that the priests and the elders, they all passed away because there was nothing to feed them. There was nothing to feed anyone else because if you know that the priests and the elders, they would be looking out for uh, the lay people. So upon that, there was just nothing for them. See, O oh Lord, how distressed I am. My spirit is deeply disturbed. My heart is overturned within me and cannot rest, for I have been very rebellious. In the streets, the sword kills and bereaves. In the house, excuse me, in the house, there is famine, disease, and death. So here Jeremiah is going through and talking about how I am, how distressed he is at this point. It says, people have heard that I groan, that I have no comfort in you. All my enemies have heard of my desperation. They have delighted, O oh Lord, that you have done it. Oh, that you would bring the day of judgment, which you have proclaimed, so that they will become like me. So Jeremiah is now, when we talk about Jeremiah, Jeremiah, you know, the role that he had was a man of, of anguish. Because to know something dreadful is going to happen and you're constantly trying to warn people to get right, turn your lives around. This is what's going to happen. The weightiness of that. He was not a very happy man. He carried a lot of weight, a lot of stuff. But here, these people are turning around and, and, and talking about things and looking at him. You know, and, and he never did anything to anybody. So let me not get on this. Let me go. So let all his wickedness come before you and deal with them as you have dealt with me. He's talking about the same anguish that I've had. Let them feel it because of all my transgressions for my groans are many and my heart is faint. God's anger over Israel. How, we're in chapter two now. How the Lord has covered the daughters of Zion, Jerusalem with a cloud in his anger. Now it's interesting before when we talked about uh the children of Israel, how God led them by a cloud. But now this cloud that has come over is a cloud of anger, a very different cloud. One was uh, bringing them to deliverance, and this one is bringing them to wrath. <clears throat> he has cast down from heaven to earth the glory and splendor of Israel and has not remembered his footstool in the days of his anger. So God's footstool is actually earth. So he just forgotten about him. Like here it says, it has not remembered his footstool in the day of his anger. He's just not even thinking about it. 
the Lord has swallowed up. He has not spared all the country uh, places of Jacob. In his wrath, he has thrown down the strongholds of the daughters of Judah, Jerusalem. So everything that they had to protect them, he's, he's annihilated. He's made it just be a breach all over the place. Nothing is withstanding his wrath. He has brought them down to the ground in disgrace. He has debased the kingdom and its prince. So everybody in the kingdom, everybody in authority has nothing now. In fierce anger, he has cut off and destroyed every horn of Israel. Every horn, the horn of Israel is the strength of Israel. Anything that was noted to give them strength has been destroyed. He has withdrawn his right hand. We all know that the right hand of God is the power hand of God from the presence of the enemy. And he burned, He has burned in Jacob like a flaming fire consuming all around. So God's mighty hand has caused this wrath that's all consuming. When he says he's all consuming, that means nothing is left undone. Nothing. He has bent his bow like an enemy. He has uh, set his right hand like an adversary and slain all that were uh, delightful and pleasing to the eye. In the tent of uh, the daughter of Zion, he has poured out his wrath like fire. So he is made just like when they were getting ready for war, that you took your best archers and you would have them to flex their bows so that they could actually hit their target. So here it is. He said he has bent his bow like an enemy. So he has targeted exactly where he wanted to be with the actual punishment that he is dishing out. The Lord has become an enemy. He has swallowed up Israel. He has swallowed up all its places. He has destroyed its strongholds and multiplied in the daughters of Judah mourning and lamentations. We said expressions of grief. So he has just amped it up. There is no peace for them that even their tears won't even give them relief. And he has violently broke down his temple like a fragile garden hedge. He has destroyed his appointed meeting places. The Lord has caused the appointed feast and Sabbath to be forgotten in Zion. And he has uh, despised and rejected the king and the prince in the indignation of his anger. So everything that they used to know, everything they took for granted, he caused it all to go away. He destroyed it all. Like he said, it was destroyed like, like it was fragile. He just crushed it. He no longer allowed them to have the joy and the benefit of having him. And he let them see what it was like not to have him. The Lord has rejected his altars. We know that God is always waiting on the altar. Everything that they had to do, he made a way that they they would not let sin eliminate them from being close to him because he built these altars for them. Now he's removed those things. He don't want nothing to do with them. That is a bad place to be. He has abandoned his sanctuary. He has given into the hand of the enemy the walls of her palace. They have made a noise in the house of the Lord as on the day of an appointed feast. He's talking about, again, uh, the people that have come in and overtook the enemies, that they're in the house of the Lord. They're in the tabernacle. They're in the temple. They kind of interchange those words a little bit, but it's the same place they're talking about that they have come in there and made noise that were not applicable to giving God praise and honor. The Lord determined to lay in ruins the city walls of the, of the daughter of Zion. He has stretched out a line. He has not stopped by his hand from destroying. He has caused the rampart and the wall to lament mourning grief. They have languished together. So when it talks about that he has stretched out a line, it's like a, a someone that does construction. Construction people make sure that every corner to corner is measured correctly. So it's making here that it lets us know that he was complete in his uh, destruction of what he did. He made sure that he got every inch that he was supposed to. Everything that fell in his purview, that it was going to be taken out. Her gates have sunk into the ground. Now we know the gates of the city is where all the business, all the the. Uh, ingress and egress happens so that is a very important thing but now it's stuck in the ground he has destroyed and broken the bars those things that were 
uh, built to keep enemies out. All of those things have been broken. Her kings and princes are exiles among the nation. The law is no more. Also, her prophets no longer find vision from the Lord. So all those that, that constantly talk that they heard from the Lord and all these prophylines that were going around, that now you have exactly no access to the Lord. There's no vision. There's nothing. The elders of the daughters of Zion sit on the ground keeping silent. They have thrown dust over their heads. We know that when we see that they uh, shave their heads or throw dust all over their bodies and wear sackcloth, that it is a sign of immense grief. So here we see right now, this is where they are. They have covered themselves with sackcloth. The virgins of Ju uh, Jerusalem have bowed their heads to the ground. The virgins are, are basically the younger ones, the ones that we know that have not been with the man, that they, at this point, they are at such despair, they don't know what to do. So all they can do is just lay out. They, don't, they just don't have what it takes to even try to fight. They don't know how to fight. My eyes fell because of tears, mourns uh, Jeremiah. Now we know Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet. But here, this is, I think, more intensified at this point of th this particular writing where he is. My spirit is deeply disturbed. My heart is poured out on the earth in grief because of the destruction of the daughters of my people, Jerusalem. When little ones and infants faint in the streets of the city. Jeremiah was really touched by how the famine had came in so swiftly and how it actually gobbled up the least of. When you talk about the least of, you usually refer to children. So he's talking about the little ones, the infants that they're, they're just fainting because they can't get anything to eat. There is no food here. Uh, they cry to their mothers. Where is the grain and wine as they faint like a wounded man in the streets of the city, as their lives slip away and is poured out in their mother's arm? So he's seeing the devastation, how children are so hungry that they're looking for, you know, uh, some type of, Saptation from their mom and they can't get anything and their mother has to literally watch children die in their arms because they don't have anything to eat how shall i console you to what shall i compare you O daughter of jerusalem with what shall i compare you so that i may comfort you O virgin daughter of zion for your ruin is as vast as the sea who can heal you your prophets have seen, imagined, for you false and foolish visions, and they have not exposed your weakness to restore you from captivity by teaching you to repent. But they have seen or imagined and declared to you false and misleading oracles. So that means that they were giving false prophecies. These people only told them what they wanted to hear. They never told them about the wrath of God. So it was what they say, things that tickled their ears, not things that would cause correction that was coming from the Lord. All who passed along the way clapped their hands in derision at you. They scoff and shake their heads at the daughters of Jerusalem, saying, Is this the city that was called the perfection of beauty, the joy of all the earth? So they walk past and they're like, ha, ha. the clapping is not a clap of applause, but a clap like... Yeah, right. You know, th this is the, the perfection of beauty. And they're, they're really laughing at their demise, how they've easily been destroyed. All your enemies have opened uh, their mouths wide against you. They scornfully hiss and gnash their teeth. They say, we have swallowed her up. Certainly this is the day for which we waited. We have reached it and we have seen it. So it's like these people never had good will for them. But it was just they were waiting for the day of their demise so that they would be able to celebrate in that. And don't we see that a lot today? That it happens in our lives and our governments and all over the place that people are just waiting for you to fall. The Lord has done what he planned. He has accomplished his word, which he commanded from days of old. He constantly told them about repenting and turning from their evil ways. He has demolished without sparing and he has caused the enemy to rejoice over you. He has exalted the power of your enemies. 
Now, when we talk about 17, 17 really kind of refers me back to what happened when the days of Noah as well, is that when he demolished and he caused for the rain to come, that no one was spared. Anybody that did not get on board was not spared. And that had, it didn't matter our children who were innocent of this, everybody was gone. And here, once again, we see the same thing. Their hearts cried out to the Lord. O wall of dark, O wall of the daughter of Zion, let your tears run down like a river day and night. Give yourself no relief. Let your eyes have no rest. So constantly in this sense of mourning and grief. Arise, cry aloud in the night. At the beginning of the night, watches. Pour out your hearts like water before the presence of the Lord. Lift up your hands to him for the life of your little ones who are faint and hungry at the head of every street. So here's right, they're talking about trying to get to a point where you can try to reach God. But what an awful thing to be needing him and to, for him to be nowhere to be found. See, O Lord, and look, with whom have you dealt this way? Should women eat their offspring? So now they're even considering cannibalism to actually <laughs> satisfy their own hunger. The little ones who were born healthy and beautiful, should the priests and the prophets be killed in the sanctuary of the Lord? So they're looking at now, what are we going to do for food? Their minds have gone somewhere totally different. The young and the old lie on the ground in the street. My virgins and my young men have fallen by the sword. You have, ki you have killed them in the days of your anger. You have slaughtered, not sparing. So hear the total devastation that Jeremiah is still talking about. You, Lord, called us in the day of the appointed feast, my terrors, dangers on every side. And there was no one who escaped or survived in the day of the Lord's anger. Those I have cared for and brought up with tenderness, my enemies annihilated them. So he's talking about those that were listening, that, that were able to hear his voice, but all of them befell the wrath of God. So he, when he said he did not spare anyone, it's exactly that. So if they were not killed, they were put into captivity. Exile, they, they just, back where in, in Jerusalem, in Judah, no, there was, that was a, uh, that was a done deal. All right, we've got to chapter three. Chapter three, uh, verses one, Jeremiah shares his affliction now. This one kind of rolls more so with his true heart of what he's feeling. Because at one point, I believe Jeremiah was trying to figure out that if God had really kind of uh, forsaked him as well. So um, here we go. I am Jeremiah, the man who has seen affliction because of the rod of his wrath. He has led me and made me walk in darkness and not in light. Surely he has turned his hand against me repeatedly all the day. So he's talking about because he's endured all these things. He has caused my flesh and my skin to waste away. He has shattered my bones. All of the things that Jeremiah went through. Remember, Jeremiah was not treated kindly. He has besieged and surrounded me with bitterness and hardship. He has made me live in dark places like those who have long been dead. He walled me in so that I cannot get out. He has weighed me down with chains. So here he's talking about that he's he's stuck. He's like, he's walled me in. I can't get out of this. And, I, and I'm carrying the weight of what's going on, the revelations of what I know. And it's like a, a ball and chain on me, this weight I can't get rid of. And even when I cry out and shout for help, he shuts out my prayers. He has blocked my ways with cut a uh, stone. He has made my paths crooked. He is to me like a bear lying in wait, a lion, like a lion hiding in secret places. He has turned aside my ways and torn me into pieces. He has made me desolate. So here he's talking about where he felt like prey. That because it was like a, a bear waiting to eat him up, a lion waiting to devour him. It's just all these things to devour him, just to consume him. And he says, he has bent his bow 
and set me as a target to his arrow. So he's under that whole thing where he's a, he feels like an enemy at this point. He has caused the arrows of his quivers to enter my inner parts. And when it talks about his inner parts, it talks about uh, an arrow when it actually goes in and pierces uh, uh, vital organs. That's what it, it basically talks about. And it says, I have become the object of ridicule to all my people and the subject of their mocking song all the day. So, you know, they're teasing him about what's going on. Oh, your God got you, but look, you look just like us. He has filled me with bitterness. He has made me drunk with warm wood bitterness. He has broken my teeth with gravel. So when it talks about broken my teeth with gravel, during that time, they still had places that had a residue of, of the grain of, of the threshing floors. And what they would do was try to scrape up everything that they could to try to make uh, some type of bread to eat. And by doing that, because there was no uh, sanitary way to do it, that they didn't want to miss whatever was there. So they took everything. So they had rocks and pebbles. And by eating this bread like this, it would cause their teeth to chip away. So their teeth became broken with the gravel because they were trying to eat these uh, bread cakes that they were making, uh, just eating whatever they could to try to survive. So he has covered me with ash and gave me cowards in the dust. My soul has been cast far away from peace. I have forgotten happiness. Can you imagine that you are under so much stress that you cannot remember what it's like to be happy? Just think of that place where he had to be. So I say my strength has perished and so has my hope and expectation of the Lord. So we see here, even though Jeremiah knew directly where things were going, that he too felt defeated and all alone. Now he talks about the hope of relief in God's mercy. Remember, O oh Lord, my affliction and my wandering, the wormwood and the gall bitterness. Now, when he talks about the gall bitterness here, he's asking him to remember that all these things that have happened to him, that it has been so bitter that it made him vomit and that it just made him sick to his stomach, that he just continuously vomited uh, when it talks about the bitterness of the gall. My soul continually remembers and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind, therefore I have hope. It is because of the Lord's loving kindnessness. Now, when we look at that word why it's highlighted, God give us loving kindness, but this lets us know that it is more than just a one-time thing. Kindness says that he's giving us more than. That kindness is just not one incident, it's continual. That we are not consumed because his tender compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great and beyond measure is your faithfulness. So great is your faithfulness, O oh God, every day. We know that the, the nighttime will yield to the day. The dark hours will yield to the light. So it says great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness morning by morning. Every morning it is brand new. And this is what he's talking about right now. Your measure of faithfulness to us that we can look forward that brand new mercies, uh, compassion and care will be shown for us. The Lord is my portion and my inheritance, my, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in him and wait expectantly on him. Do we have the expectant hope of waiting on God? Even in our dark hours and our dark times? This is the question. The Lord is good to those who wait confidently for him, to those who seek him on the authority of God's word. Now we have to seek God through God's word. We can't do it with what somebody else is telling us, but we have to know the word for ourselves. This is where this is going. It is good that one waits quietly because if you're talking, you can't hear. So sometimes you have to read, meditate, and listen for the word. Listen for what God is speaking to you because if you're talking, you're going to miss it. For the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he shall bear the yoke of godly discipline in his shoes. Take the wrath, take the correction, 
that is necessary when you're young because then you can actually be formed and corrected because once you get old with bad behaviors, you're going to continue to be bad behaviors and not probably be a very successful or likable person because you didn't get the training. You didn't get the correction you needed. Let him sit alone and hope and be and keep quiet because God has laid it on him for his benefit. So when these things happen and God silences us, don't go around telling everybody, else, but sit and wait. Listen for when he's going to bring you relief because he's doing it for your good. Let him put his mouth in the dust in recognition of unworthiness. There yet be hope. There may yet be hope. Let him t uh, give his cheek to the one who strikes him. Let him be filled with reproach for the Lord will not reject forever. So someone, you know, this thing, if they hit you on one cheek, turn the other cheek. We even say, how can you do that? Jesus gave his cheek when they plucked the hair from his cheek. So if he can do it, we can do it. For uh, if he causes grief, then he will uh, have compassion according to his abundant loving kindness and tender mercies. For he does not afflict willingly and from his heart or grieve the children of men to trample and crush under uh, his feet all the prisoners of the land to deprive a man of justice in the presence of the Most High, to defraud a man in his lawsuit, the Lord does not approve of these things. So now he's going through, and as you go, you'll continue after 36 to see a bunch of things where it talks about to do, that you need to do for uh, God. And it talks about uh, the do's and the don'ts, and we'll continue with that in uh, our next section on uh, Lamentations. But we've come to a pivotal point right now that we've seen all these things and we see the wrath that can happen if we don't follow God's orders. So with me, if you don't know him for yourself as your personal savior, it is your opportune time today. The salvation prayer that we have, you repeat after me. Father, it is written in your word that if I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that you have raised him from the dead, I shall be saved. Therefore, Father, I confess that Jesus is my Lord. I will make him the Lord of my life right now. I believe in my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead. I renounce my past life with Satan and close the doors to any of his devices. I thank you for forgiving me of all my sins. Jesus is my Lord and I am a new creation. Old things have passed away. Now all things become new. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have recited that, guess what? It's just that easy. You're saved. You're in the safety of his arms. If that's you, make sure that you put in the chat your name and where you're uh, located at so that we can make sure that we can assist you in finding a Bible-based church that will help you and walk this journey with you. We want to make sure that we lovingly help you along the way. If it was you that you found yourself in these scriptures that you want uh, to repent, you found yourself in a place of repentance, God bless you. This is what the scripture is for. It is to heal us. It is to correct us. So God bless you for that. And one more thing before we leave. Remember to like, share, and subscribe to this channel. It actually helps us get the gospel message out because what we are doing is spreading the word. We're spreading the word of of God to those that may not have uh, regular access, but they can come on to a computer and actually hear the word for themselves. So God bless you. Make sure that you're here again tomorrow at six o'clock where we continue in It's About Time, where we're going through the Bible chronologically in a one-year time period so that we can tell the Bible story. All right, God bless you and have a good evening.